Joe, thank you, Michael. Thank you to everyone at the RPS uh, for making this event possible. Great to be part of this In Conversation series, of course, with many wonderful photographers engaging, as you will see, of course, and you will know from uh, the event webpage for this event, um, that this is a series of In Conversations where leading individuals talk about how they use photography, of course, as artists, scientists, educators, publishers, curators, and we could add, I think, in the case of Gideon, as activists. Now, Gideon, it's a real pleasure um, to be in conversation with you. We um, have known each other for some time now and have been talking about your work in a number of different ways, in different contexts and different platforms. We haven't, uh, at, uh, until now, talked at such great distance because you are currently uh, on location doing what you do best in British Columbia. That is correct, isn't it? Yes, that, um, <clears throat> that's right. I am... Um... Here, um, in some ways, um, perhaps in the role of the slowest news photographer in history, um, photographing the aftermath of the um, huge fires, which, um, in, in fact, a particular fire called the White Rock Lake Fire, um, which devastated you know, a huge amount of British Columbia um, back in August. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm very slow. I, I don't chase the burning fires. Um, I am, you know, kind of trying to look at the kind of deep traces and impacts of the fires on communities and on the landscape. Exactly. I mean, the aftermath, of course, is uh, absolutely crucial because that is where the lives are lived um, once the conflagration has eased or to a certain degree uh, dissipated. Now, you have done this not only with fire, of course, and this is an ongoing project for you, uh, one of great commitment and, and duration. You've also done this, of course, with floods um, in your major series, The Drowning World. Now, these, of course, are two of the great uh, uh, environmental threats that we face. Sadly, or certainly by no means the only two, um, but you focus on this, obviously, on these two kind of um, approaches, shall we say, to understanding the ecological crisis that we're in now for many years. It's a major life work as much as it is a very necessary ecological and social project. So I wonder if you could just um, uh, take us through, if you like, the projects that you've been working on and, uh, and put them in context for us so we're all in a kind of shared space of understanding about your body of work. Um, absolutely. OK, so... Um, in full transparency, um, I got to this talk slightly later, you know, slightly earlier than had, I had anticipated. So I had planned on spending, um, you know, another hour kind of organizing my presentation. So I'm in, I'm in some disarray. But um, having said that, I, I, I have something here to, here to show you. Um, I'll give you a bit of a sense of like the, and I think what's important important in, in talking about is, that, is the, the various kind of contrasting narrative threads that have emerged from my work on both flood and fire. Um, of course, I've been working on flooding for much longer. My, you know, I've been working on the issue of flooding really since 2007. Um, and I've made, you know, more than 20 flood response trips to different floods around the world. Um, my work on fire is much more recent. And Gareth, I have to say it's on some levels really inspired by you and, and, your, and your kind of prodding at a certain, you know, your, your kind of insights and your prodding and, and your thoughts about how kind of the narratives of fire and flood could work in, in conjunction with each other. And so let's, let me share my screen. Um, okay, are you seeing that? Um, so- Absolutely, yeah, all good. Um, so, 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 so the central narrative of Drowning World, My Work on Flooding, is a series that I call Submerged Portraits. And they are very kind of simple, direct portraits of people in, in, in flooded situations. Um, and the, the engagement with me and the camera is, is crucial. Um, and I think they, they are very, um, in some ways very documentary, but they're also quite constructed in that, you know, people are, I didn't necessarily find people here, people are at their homes and their communities, but they're, 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 they're positioned for the camera, which I think is sometimes a bit of an unsettling sort of, um, unsettling thing for the viewer. Um, I think this is my favorite picture, of, you know, one of my, my favorite, favorite pictures ever taken of Florence Abram, photographed in Ekbegin in, in Nigeria. And 
I think this also involves some of the poorest and some of the wealthiest people on earth. So I think it's also a challenge to the idea of um, climate change as something which is far away, which happens in, you know, in kind of remote countries around the world. Um, and when I photographed the, the, the flooding in Germany recently, that was a common statement that this doesn't happen in Germany, it's something which happens in Bangladesh or Africa. Um, and then moving on to another narrative series, which is something which I call Floodlines, which is very different. It's a very geometric series of images, um, working with the reflection and following the line of water as it moves through homes, individuals, communities, um, intimate spaces and public spaces. Um, and then the other main series of Drowning World is a series which I call Watermarks. And this is an archive I've collected of personal flood damage photographs. They're not taken by me, they are individuals' pictures. And I'm fascinated by the impact that floodwaters make on the physical chemistry and surfaces of these images. And then moving on to some of the work on, on fire. And this is the contrasting series. I haven't even really got my names worked out for the fire series, but these are some of the fire portraits. Um, so far from, these are from Australia, California. Um, and it's a very different process making a photograph within the aftermath of a fire and within a flood. Um, as you can see, it's a much more kind of chaotic environment. And in order to make the, these portraits work, um, I have to be geometrically very, very precise, just to make sense of these visually chaotic environments. Um, you know, they, they, it's, it's a very different kind of um, visual process to, to you know, in, in a flood, you're Planes are, are very flat, um, whereas in a, in a fire is so, it's so different. Sorry, I'm just trying to get through these. As you can see, the kind of structure of that. And then, and I think what's also a crucial thing is to give a sense of location as well. Um, you know, to make you know, because I think. Countries are in some ways not that different, but the location sense is very important. Um, and then this is a series of landscapes, again, from um, Australia um, and Greece mostly. Um, and again, these, these are kind of landscapes affected by fire. I mean, on Avia Island, there were you know millions of olive trees destroyed in the recent fires there, which is a cultural, you know, loss. Um, so again, the way, the, way, the way landscape is impacted by a fire. And these are some surfaces, um, quite abstract images, surfaces kind of scorched by fire. Okay, so, I mean, we can come back to some, some of the other things I'm doing. I just thought this was a useful introduction to some of the kind of narrative threads which are, are kind of emerging at, at, at the moment. No, thank you, Gideon. I mean, it's incredibly uh, useful uh, uh, portfolio of work, both on obviously on, on, the, on the flooding front and on the fire front. And you're absolutely right about the very, very different um, uh, impact and aftermath of, of each of those catastrophes on individuals, you know, on properties, of course, and on communities. Now, you are in, you know, the aftermath right now of the fire zone, and we're seeing very, very different images, while also 
uh, remaining anchored around the residents of those properties. Now, there's great dignity, you know, which is very important in your work to those participants and how they are holding everything together, at least for the split second of the image um, uh, that we see, um, while they're, you know, their entire life, their all their possessions and presumably much of their future in all sorts of different ways has literally gone up in smoke. Now, what is your relationship with those people at the moment of encounter? And how do you make your case to them, often very, very soon after this you know, disaster has, has, has made its first marks, um, as, to, as to why they should take part in such a project? Yeah, okay, well, I, th I think that that's, that's a, cr a crucial question. That's something which I'm, I'm encountering here kind of day, day, day by day. Um, I think, I think these portraits are, are, I mean, I think in the whole notion of portraiture, I think there's, there's a, a meeting of some kind of, there's a meeting between the photographer and the subject. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a confrontation, it's some kind of engagement. And for me that, what, whatever kind of cycles of fate have brought me and this person together, there's this moment of connection, this moment of portraiture, which is, I don't know, it's the center of what I do. And I think it's, it's the most important, the most important part of my practice. Um, I, th I think what I'm very clear about with people is that I, I, I don't offer any relief. I'm not an aid organization. I'm not someone who's coming to help them in any obvious physical way. What I offer is a kind of witnessing, a deep witnessing of, of, their, of their experience of what's happened to them. Um, it's very important to me that they're not portrayed as pathetic victims, as, as people in, in abject misery. I think their strength and their power, I mean, however difficult the circumstances is, I, I need to portray them in a, in a dignified way to show their strength and their, you know, kind of their integrity and resolution as people. Um, and um, although you know, in many cases, some people this has been the first time going back into their spaces, um, it's not easy for them. Um, I've had a lot of feedback, particularly recently with the firework, that people have found it quite a helpful, almost cathartic experience mm -hmm. to, be, to be photographed in their spaces. And I mean, remember, alongside this, there's, I do interview people, I do spend time with them. It's not, I don't just arrive and take a picture right away. There's, 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 there, is, there is quite a long process of kind of in, engagement. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm not like, you know, a quick crew or media person coming in and trying to get a, a quick picture. You know, some of these pictures are the result of, you know, half a day, you know, it's half a day of time spent with people. You know, it's not, you know, I mean, depending on, on the kind of circumstances. No, exactly. I mean, I'm struck by how you, you know, you opened your, your comments earlier by saying, you know, you're, you're the slowest news photographer around. But in a way, this is the news that stays news, isn't it? Their lives are forever transformed by this experience, um, let alone whether they've lost loved ones uh, alongside everything else they've lost. And in a way, this is the most important thing for us to understand. Remote, you know, as we might be, of course, although many, many floods, not so much fires, floods have, have hit England in recent years whether we're close to that uh, unfolding uh, epicenter or not, what we have to understand is, as we are all aware now, there is not a, there is not a moment at which everything gives way and, and collapses. This is a rolling crisis and a rolling form of collapse. And in a way, your photography is much more acute on that idea of something unfolding in time than perhaps the news image that we are more familiar with. So. Could you talk a little bit more about your, your sense of relationship to place and perhaps how you think about the images working to tell the ongoing story of a place? Because you did mention that in your, your comments earlier. And I think that sense of place, regardless of poverty or wealth, is really important to how we think about your larger body of work as well, beyond these two series. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, th I think that is, I mean, you know, I, th I think that, that you know that, that, that is again is something which I'm, I'm thinking about a lot. I mean, particularly working on kind of fire now. You know, it's very much in my thoughts. Is that, you know how does it come across that this picture is, is made in Canada, and this picture is made in Greece, and this picture is made in Australia? You know, how how was that kind of visually manifest? How do you how do the people come come across? Um, uh, 
um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really pleased because I, I wasn't certain it was going to be feasible. But in the last few days, we have made a really great engagement with um, people in the local um, First Nations group, the Okanagan um, First Nations Band. Um, close to, close to and this is part of the reason I came to this area that I was hoping to document the way First Nations communities in Canada mm -hmm. are affected by fire. Um, and it, you know, and, and the, the, the people, are, it's, you know, it's, it's not a lot of people that, you know, around here, but a lot in, in the last few days, I've made four, four portraits of people from, from that community. And it's such a kind of contrast to that community to people nearby um, living on the kind of in, 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 in beautiful lakeside homes, um, you know, and, um, and, 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 and again, when, when, when I was working in Australia, you know, it was very important for me to um, document some people from the kind of Aboriginal groups who were affected by fire, who, whose images are not, are not, are not seen, seen much. Um, so, um, you know, engagement with different kinds of communities and in, in different places is is really is is key to me and and because I mean I think something which I've achieved with Browning World, which I'm working to try to get bring up to the same level with fire, is the sense of, of a very much a global crisis, mm -hmm. people from all different parts of the world, all different kinds of communities. Um, you know, so. Um, well, well, I'm very glad that you mentioned that you're working, you know, where you are now locally with First Nations communities, because, of course, the, 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 the question implicit in, in the observations about place is, of course, your relationship as a photographer coming from elsewhere. And where you come from is, you know, is always the same. You come from your home. But where you land is, is a very, very different story indeed. And how you're perceived and how you're welcomed, whether you are seen as, as uh, uh, equal, shall we say, in all sorts of registers to the community you're coming into, um, whether you come with a historical story, whether you come with very much a present tense urgency and so on and so on. And we're very aware and, and of course, sensitive and rightly so to, to those dynamics and those interrelations. Yeah. Um, could you, again, perhaps tease that out a little bit? Because... So, so, so I am, look, I am acutely aware, and it's something I've been thinking about recently, is the extent to which my position as a photographer is interwoven with the kind of power and privilege of, you know, of kind of, of, of whiteness, of relative wealth, um, you know, and, and, you know, growing up as, as a, a white South African, being born into privilege in a situation of great inequality, um, has made me aware that, you know, how, however compassionate, however concerned I, I may be about what the world, I do come into it with some kind of inherent structural power. Um, and I think, you know, and I look back in my earlier work, and it's, 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 I think I was much less conscious of it, obviously, early, earlier, earlier in my career, but, um, you know, I, I, I with, 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 with that awareness, I, um, I feel, you know, approaching people in situations with humility and integrity, you know, and um, I, I, I feel as well, you know, I, think, I think that's important, but I feel um, for, for whatever reasons linked to my own history, I, I have an ability to kind of portray people in moments of trauma and distress, you know, or, some, or somehow I can um, be quite visually articulate in conveying climate and other kinds of trauma. Um, there's a whole long backstory and debate to my own kind of family's history of trauma and, and my, my parents' history of kind of escaping Nazi Germany and losing much of their family, including my, 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 my grandmother to the Holocaust. You know, so I think personal family trauma is in some ways, which I'm just coming to understand, part of my, the, my own reason for kind of seeking out the trauma of others in, in, in this way. 
Um, and it, I like to think that I offer, yeah, as I said before, the kind of witnessing which, which people welcome. No, absolutely. I mean, thank you very much for that very full and 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 insightful response. I mean, I've known you and your work for you know some time now, but I do think you moved very, very quickly to really try and interrogate, as you say, forms of privilege and whiteness in your own practice, however well intentioned historically, um, uh, alongside, of course, the global uprising of the last 18 months or so. And, and I think that is absolutely a testament to the inherent um, uh, commitment and witness of, of your work as you've described. Now, there, there are two triangulations, if you like, that I'd like to sort of ask you to map, map onto each other in a sort of Venn diagram way. There's the relationship between people in their place and your purpose in being there, which we talked a little bit about. And then there is, again, this larger sense of trauma, which has a family background very acutely for you, which is ecological, historical and personal. And in a way, we're seeing, you know, the implications of both those those arrangements, you know, meet in your very, very striking photography. Now, alongside that 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 dynamic, should we say, is the question of, of, of a formal presentation, an aesthetic understanding of what you're photographing. And you've already identified very, very clearly, and we've seen very strongly the differences in flood, flood damage and fire damage. But all the way back to Goya, there's been this debate around the aesthetics of, of traumatic imagery and how we navigate that relationship. What's your sense of, of, of the power the, of, 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 of aesthetics in communicating messages of witness? Okay, well, I think they're difficult, difficult mm -hmm. questions and challenges within that, you know, and there's, you know, is the question of how the camera loves ru ruins, mm -hmm. you know, how kind of destruction in ruin is quite aesthetic. Should I share my screen very briefly just to get a sense of some of... No, please do. At any point, any point, please, please uh, seize the, yeah, the seize the day. In that area. So in um, my, my, you know, my, my, my recent work um, in Greece, I was, did some work kind of being drawn to kind of washing machines and doors and windows, kind of windows on the world. And I mean, this is, I mean, debate, this is, of course, personal destruction and loss, um, but it's is also kind of aesthetic. And then I also began doing something where I, was initially shown this olive. This was this was a two and a half thousand year old olive tree called the Bride, which was destroyed on the fires in Elia, along with apparently millions of other olive trees. And I was drawn to the the forms and patterns and shapes of these dead olive trees, which I kind of feel, in order to kind of tell the story, and and that's a huge cultural loss. Of these trees, some kind of, you know, I, I, I see them almost as kind of African masks taking a kind of sculptural form. Um, and I don't know if I'm kind of aesthetic, you know, this is excessive aestheticization of this ruin and destruction. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of bring this into our discussion. And um, well, no, I think it's extremely interesting. It's more than interesting. It's extremely relevant and necessary. And thank you, uh, as always, Gideon, for sharing it. Um, uh, Catherine, Ethan and David in the chat are all commenting alongside my own question about the nature of the aesthetics, uh, alongside the power of your of your images. And I think we can all agree that the stronger, the more powerful an image, the more likely it is to have an impact on us. Now, what I'm really struck by with these is, of course, that, you know, like any photograph that marks an instant in time, these actually contain a full temporal journey. So we're again alongside this idea of place and, and time operating um, inexhaustibly and indistinguishably almost from each other. We see the past of the olive tree, the two and a half thousand years you mentioned, we see it's tr tragically traumatic present and we're implied and implicated in its future, I think, by the way that you photograph them. So really, really startling work here, Gideon, as, as we would expect. Now, um, there are questions coming into the chat, as I've mentioned. Please do keep them coming. Um, so, so I'd like to just, sorry, yeah, before I, I'd like to come to one now, Gideon, but please go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to explain, in seeking a kind of parallel narrative in Canada, 
I've been struck by seeing places where trees have burnt into the ground. Like basically this is a tree and it, the roots burnt as well. So I'm seeing absences in the ground. So I'm trying to kind of, this is something I'm in the midst of working on at the moment, but just thinking about if, if there's a parallel, parallel, parallel narrative working mm -hmm. in the same way of kind of photographing just the holes in the ground left behind by, you know, holes where there, where there were trees. Well, this is the idea of negative space, isn't it? Absolutely. So you're, you're, you're photographing absence in a way. And by then, uh, by that process, making us very aware indeed of what's been lost um, and, and what is increasingly under threat, even if it hasn't yet been taken from us. Um, like I said, please keep those questions coming into the chat. We'll bring them in a little bit earlier where they're where they're relevant. I'd also like to draw attention to the fact, that, of course, that Gideon's own website has these and many other portfolios of work that you can obviously look through at your own pace, gideonmendel.com, where, where his own body of work across many decades is fully, fully documented. But let's talk about a very practical aspect of this work, Gideon, because, of course, you know, fires start, floods occur, and you have to decide where to go and often how to get there in very difficult circumstances. And, and, and Stuart's asked this a little earlier. How how long does a flood last for you? Which is a great question, I think, because of course, the news story around a flood is very brief. And how do you get there often? I mean, how do you set up a journey like this, whether flood or fire? And are there significant differences, if, if any? Um, well, I mean, floods have to be a lot quicker on my feet. I mean, for, with fires, firstly, I've got no interest in, in pursuing the moment of um, the, 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 the burning flames with the, with the fires. So um, it's, I'm, I, you know, you know I, I don't want to be in the way, I'm, I'm a coward, I don't want to be in the way of the emergency response. So with fires, I always come sometime afterwards. And I think what I've, I'm finding over here is sometime between the moment of the fire and before houses get clean, cleared away, which can be anything between, you know, a week and kind of six six weeks to, to two months. So getting to fires, it's not as stressful as into floods. And people who know me, colleagues, friends, will know, family, will know of the extremely stressed out, anxious state I get into when there's a huge flood somewhere, when I'm trying to research and figure out the logistics. You know, do I have the resources to go? Is this a flood that's worth going to you know, but will I get there in time to find the water still there? Um, you know, and the kind of geology of different kinds of flooding. So obviously flash floods are very quick and it's almost impossible to be there on time. But certain, you know, in, in some countries, you know, sometimes floods do stick around for, you know, a week, a few weeks when I photographed in, in Nigeria. I was actually there kind of five weeks after the floods and, and they were still pretty, pretty, pretty present, you know. So it depends very much on the kind of, drainage and the geography of spaces. But I mean, it is a matter of a lot of time and kind of intense research, just trying to trying to trying to figure that out. Absolutely. Now, I mean, I guess following on from that, you know, your arrival um, and documenting of, of the landscape is one thing. But then, of course, there's a very, very uh, different response, depending on where we are to how the larger community and society, the infrastructure of, of, the, of the nation or region responds. Now, have you found that sometimes this has been counterintuitive to what you expected based on levels of wealth? Have you well, found a, re a response, you know, in different communities that has surprised you perhaps? Well, I mean, of, of course, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously when I've worked in places like Germany, for example, you have a huge and immediate kind of response from the state and civil society, um, you know, uh, you know, sometimes I felt in Germany, I was kind of witnessing, you know, all the might of the German state and society taking on all the might of nature, you know, mm -hmm. hues of trucks and excavators and materials. And, um, and there's obviously the state response is also often a huge civil society response. Again, in Germany, you know, huge amounts of volunteers out there to help clear, clear up a lot of support, a lot, you know, I mean, I think often people feel inspired by floods to really kind of help people. The same with fires, you know, I mean, again, in Australia, an immense amount of support. And, you know, I think the civil society response for supporting people. And I think sometimes it's difficult to kind of coordinate and, and organize all that help. 
you know, and you know, and to, to get help which people need, you know, get materials which people need, um, can be challenging. Um, you know, in contrast, you know, when I was photographing in in, in Nigeria, you know, the people there had no insurance. There was a sort of refugee camp camp for displaced people, you know, where they could go to, but there was minimal minimal help or support from from, from the state. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I mean, one 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 aspect, of course, of country, but it, it it is, and I think also different places that have got different cultures around insurance. Right. Exactly. I mean, I mean, one aspect, of course, of of what happens when a flood or a fire, you know, um, assaults a community that's already under stress on multiple fronts, ecologically, economically, socially, and so on. Of course, is that it becomes, you know, just another part of what is already a traumatic landscape. And perhaps we saw versions of that un unfold, you know, again, irregularly and unevenly during the, the height of the pandemic uh, uh, over recent months is, is that it, become, it's, it becomes something that is not necessarily the most pressing concern when food on the table and some form of shelter is daily an urgency. And so, uh, again, I wonder what the, what the aftermath, the accumulating aftermath is of such floods, particularly when they're recurrent um, to the communities that you've photographed and to the people you've spoken to. Sometimes this is a, a one-off event for them, at least so far, and, and other times it might be part of a pattern that gets worse. And actually, I mean, in my experience, because I've, I've done a lot of work on flooding in the southern states of the USA, you know, in um, South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and um, particularly in, in, in South Carolina, um, you know, I, I photographed flooding in 2015, and then again in 2017 and 2018 and you know there's i mean as you kind of know with the kind of warming of the water of, of, of the ocean hurricanes and, and the hurricane season is getting longer and getting worse every year i mean I, I wasn't in america to kind of witness the flooding this year but you know we, we saw immense flooding um and you know i, th I think some people who are making south carolina were just saying you know you know that they, in, in 2015 they had had the, the what they called the thousand year event, the worst sort of climate event in a thousand years, and then they kind of kept on coming year after year. Um, so I think certain areas of the world are, of course, much more vulnerable and much more subject to kind of flooding, um, as is the case with fire. You know, parts of California, parts of Canada, Australia. You know, certain communities are, are you know frequently affected by fire, and again. Um, I suppose just this gets this gets us to an important point is that these two elements, both damaged by fire and damaged by flood, this is nothing new. I mean, they've, they've been happening, you know, for, for millennia. In, in fact, most ancient mythologies, including our Bible, have you know ancient flood flood stories. Um, you know, so and, and I think the idea of the flood as being this act of nature, this unstoppable force of nature, which comes along and which you've got no no power against. It, that's that, that's a powerful kind of mythological kind of image. And so I'm not photographing anything new, but I think what is clear and scientifically being absolutely kind of proven is that they're happening more and more and more and more frequently, both both floods and fires. Absolutely, so, as, absolutely. As, as, as our climate warms, and I I yeah, I fear for the our future and the future of our children and you know again as i'm sure as you know it doesn't look like the impending cop 26 summit is going to offer us very much in terms of hope hope for, you know hope you know for governmental change you know at a, and i think at a point in the world when we most need coordinated global governance we are kind of most you know that, you know that that is seems less and less likely in terms of kind of responses and taking global action against climate change. Yeah. And, and moving it away from a very individual thing to a global political thing, I think is so important. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you've summarised that very, very well. And in a way, that leads on to what I was going to ask you next, which is about this conversation balancing both the subject of your photographs, of course, the object of your gaze, and also how these images work in the world. Because um, the Drowning World Project, particularly, of course, being longer in duration so far, 
um, has taken many forms, hasn't it? And I wonder if you could talk um, talk us through a little bit about how those images have circulated and, and in, in what, what arenas and at what different levels. Um, well, I mean, so I, th I think people, I suppose, find it hard to pigeonhole my work because, you know, I think there's a question, am I a documentary photojournalist? You know, am I an artist? Am I an activist? And I think I'm proud to say that the, I think the work has worked at, multi at multiple levels, you know, that it's, these images have appeared in, you know, numerous publications, you know, frequently in the Guardian newspaper and magazine, there've been in National Geographic, Geo magazine, many publications around the world. So they, they, they work in the kind of journalistic context. They, they also, you know, have a, had a long, a long life and, um, and, you know, a kind of, a lot of, um, presence in museums and galleries and photo festivals and you know, you know Gareth you yourself have kind of curated it curated the work of you know kind of frequently in those in those in those contexts um, and um, more and more um, the, 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 the work is oh, maybe we can show um, the, 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 the work is frequently kind of seen in kind of con context of, of of activism, you know, and um, and cl climate change protests, and, that, and that's something I'm I'm I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, maybe show a few images of that. <coughs> no, please do. I mean, as you're doing that, uh, David in the chat says, I think, and and, and I hope uh, is, is responding to, to what you're saying. The images are all of these things, and that's extremely rare and extremely valuable, of course, because the the more that these images can circulate in mul multiple arenas and locations. Um, the better you know the better they can reach people of course yeah so sorry <coughs> and this i find this made quite powerful about this work being seen in these sort of contexts um, I mean, I think what's so striking about this, of course, is that, the, the, you know, there is that collapse of distance between us and them, so-called, those who are, are suffering from the conflagration or the, or the waters, bringing us together, of course, in those images, in those locations that we might be very familiar with, our, our streets, our, our town centres and so on. And, and, and this was, I thought was pretty cool, this was some guerrilla advertising done by Extinction Rebellion of replacing existing advertising in the tube with... Um, Mm -hmm. Exactly. There was a, um, a protest, perhaps some of the images appeared um, uh, in, in the sequence you've just shown, which were almost like kind of shields, uh, I think, for the Paris, Paris protests, where there was a sense both of a, you know, a kind of not an off offensive image, but a, an image, you know, designed to impact, but also one that has a kind of defensive role as well, which is... Yes. Well, well we, we actually produced four, sadly it never happened, but for the COP summit in Paris, we produced 99 what we called carry shields, mm -hmm. um, which were designed to be used in a protest, <coughs> which unfortunately because of the Bataclan attacks never, never, never happened. But these particular shields have been used a lot. And at that same year, we brought them to London for, to be carried in a, in a, in a London protest. Um, and they were confiscated by the police because they were seen as being potentially offensive weapons because they were yeah, yeah. Um, exactly so i mean i mean i mean the ironies around around you know the idea of an, an image being dangerous of course are um yeah. uh are, are, are many and we could we could go into that at great length um with these collaborations when they've entered the kind of the, you know the, the the circuitry of the protest movements are these formal collaborations that you've had with them or are, are, they, are they are the images being taken up spontaneously by others and circulated. And um, so it's at, at moments, I've, I've, it's been a relatively formal collaboration with organizations like Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace. And, you know, I suppose in the yeah. sense that I've, I've made the work available to them and they've, and they've, they've, they've used them. I mean, there's a bit of anxiety because you know, obviously these images are quite, some of them which, which they've used are quite beautiful objects, which I don't want to lose. 
and sometimes in the chaos, in the chaos of, a, of a protest, you never quite know what's going to happen and where, where they'll end up. Um, but it's gone really well, and I think it's been, you know, I think people have responded quite strongly to them. In some circumstances, organizations have used the work and have, you know, made, made their own prints, which have been, been, been kind of, you know, as kind of temporary prints. But yeah, I, so I think for me, to have the work which can work in the gallery context and work on the streets at the same time is, yeah, it's something which I, I think is great and, and, and I'm very proud of. No, absolutely, and, you, and and rightly so. Now, I'm just I'm just curious now to think a little bit about you know your other significant bodies of work around HIV, of course, around the apartheid struggle and so on, and whether you see your uh, your responses to flood and fire. I mean, regardless, of course, of the image series that you've set up, which are very, very different. But do you see your own attitude in relation to these subject matters as having fundamentally shifted from those earlier, very socially, very human focused um, scenarios? Now you've got a much larger ecological awareness by definition, of course, you have to because of the subject matter. And you're aware of the larger landscapes and also the non-human um, in those landscapes that has also suffered. But has your sense of, of, of a kind of the dynamic of engagement shifted in a fundamental way with this new body of work, or is it a continuity? Um, I think it's both. You know, I think there's a continuity is that I've, I'm, I'm always, you know, drawn, and it doesn't make my life easy necessarily, but I'm always drawn to <coughs> working on what I see as the key social and political issues of, 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 of our times. Um, you know, and, and I, I, I suppose I came of age as a photographer with an initiation of fire of, of you know, being mm -hmm. thrust straight into photographing the struggle against apartheid in South Africa and the state's brutal response. And that was my, that, that was the beginning, that was the kind of source of my work. And, you know, in the 90s, I really began photographing HIV, both in the UK and the West and, and, and mostly in Africa. And that was my focus and obsession really for, for much of the 90s. Um, you know, when, when I had young kids, I did this sort of mental exercise of trying to imagine the world they'd be living in when they were my age. So I was starting to research and think about the, the, the world of 2040 and 2050. Mm -hmm. And that really drew me to thinking a lot about climate change. And also, like researching the, the sort of imaging of climate change, I just felt it was very, in inverted commas, white. It was like polar bears and glaciers and far away remote places and didn't feel very immediate. So I really wanted to try and do something which felt very immediate and very visceral and very in your face, which is sort of, I suppose, the kind of, you know, the core, core of this, the, you know, the, 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 the impulse towards, towards this work. But what's I think very important, and we've already commented on in slightly different ways earlier, is of course that you're, you're not showing, you know, the, the 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 image of horror. I mean, you're showing how people are having to live with the horror of that, you know, that unfolding moment, series of days, week, several weeks, whatever it might be, and that seems to me a much more, you know, strategically and politically useful way, perhaps, of galvanizing an urgency around these issues because we find all sorts of ways, I would include myself in this, of course, of, of you know, setting up mechanisms of, of uh, evasion around the, the traumatic image. These are images of trauma, but they're a trauma that is unfolding alongside our ongoing life. We can't say it happened and it's historical, it's active and it's ongoing. So how do you think, given that, if you accept that, how do you think of the of the different registers of the series within the Drowning World and Fire projects? Because they obviously speak to each other. We've spoke, spoken particularly, let's say, about you know the the the, uh, the 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 post fire images and the portraits in both series. But as you said, with Drowning World, there's a lot more going on in the other parts of the project, including moving image work as well. Yes, which is which is another whole whole discussion. And um, Gareth, as as we go into the final minutes of talk, I thought it might be interesting to offer a, a kind of a sneak preview of some of the work which I've been doing over here in Canada. That would be great. Particularly in relation to what you're saying. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and <coughs> some of my, I mean, and, and we can talk about these other questions, but so these are, 
the kind of portraits which I've managed to do. And, and you can see, I've, I've been working for eight, nine days now. And, you know, they, they don't, they're not, you know, it takes quite a while. I don't do a whole lot of portraits. So the, these are some of the portraits. And, and I think these do speak to the questions which you've just, just, been, just been raising. Um, and I'm still, you know, this is, I'm still in the early phases of phase editing and work, working out which, which ones are the, are, the, are, the, are, the, are the right images to, to choose the kind of questions and working in the, in the, in the, with, with, with the organizing First Nations people. Um, that's, this is, this is, this is Tiffany, who is an, an amazing person who photographed, and that's the RV vehicle which, which, where, where she stepped. <laughs> and, that, and that's her grandfather. Was the, the grumpiest person I photographed. He didn't like to, to, to be there, be the, you know, for as long as I would like him. He got very impatient with me, but he, but he was great and, and he just spoke amazingly. Mm -hmm. This is family. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm still busy deciding which, which images that was the one to go for, the close up or the, the far away, which gives the whole, the whole structure. I, I mean, a question alongside this is to do with you know, accumulation to do with volume, a certain scale of uh, a number of images versus a distillation. And, and, you know, one could make arguments in both directions, couldn't we? We could say that the more images we see, we realise how widespread it is. You could show 100, 200 perhaps, or you could refine down as perhaps you're more inclined to, to images that encapsulate and stand for the larger crisis. But uh, are your thoughts on that constantly fluctuating? Yes, of course, of course, is how to, and how to put them together and how to, you know, how they're going to be seen. And I mean, I think what I've said to you is I'm, I'm starting to think of the idea of a new book, which would be both flood and fire. Yeah. Like you'd start from the one side with flood and the other side with fire. Um, and that these different narratives would kind of work their way towards the center. And by definition, in our earlier conversation about that, of course, the book, you would, you would have to invert to read the second part. The world would be turned upside down in a way, the, the booker's world, quite literally, to meet in the middle. I think it's a very powerful idea. And, and if, if uh, our audience are interested in that, obviously they should keep uh, an eye on your website, again, for developments in, in that area. And, and there'll be a, you know, a crowdfunding, you know, some kind of crowdfunding thing, which is, which is gonna happen before too long. And I just thought something very different, which I've been working on, which might be interesting. The, the, this, these are all um, bits of melted aluminium from cars, um, which I kind of positioned on this, on this burnt car to photograph. It's a very different kind of image, just experimenting with different ways of telling the story. And again, I might be accused of kind of excessive aestheticizing of disaster. That's something I can, I guess, I, get, I, I do get drawn to. But I think in a way, you know, it, it, there's no such thing as, as an unhelpful, you know, and, and constructive conversation in that way at the same time, because, you know, by debating these issues, of course, we're forced to engage with these images and really think about what they mean and what, what they're showing and what their implications are. Um, and I think, you know, all your work in all sorts of different ways really does that brilliantly. Many thanks to Sarah just now for, for you know, your own parting words. I'm really glad that you could have been with us, Sarah. Just wanting to look at the, the last questions now coming into the chat, just so that we uh, hopefully can, can touch on all of them. Uh, David um, has, has raised the, the, the quite literally elemental issue around your work. Of course, you working directly with fire and water and implicitly, of course, with earth and its, uh, uh, the traces on, on the earth of both flood and, flood and fire. Air remains, if you like, directly unengaged with, but if the implications come through the, the increase in fires, particularly around hurricanes and tornadoes. Are you tempted to try and, and take it into a, a fully elemental catalogue in due course? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I think that is, that is the key thing. And, and, and Gareth, you, you know that you're partly responsible for sending me in the route of fire. Um, um, I, I do have a sense that in the, maybe for the, the remainder, you know, I'm 62 now, I don't have too many decades left, left of photographing, but maybe, for the remainder of my photographic career, it's going to be working through all the different elements and thinking about, you know, you know, earth, water, fire, and air. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think obviously, earth for me is probably going to relate in some level to drought and photographing, trying to 
visualized drought and air is probably inevitably going to be pollution in some sense but right right you know kind of uh, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm a long way from kind of getting into that but maybe that's once i'm finished with fire and water maybe those are the two next steps to to kind of move towards no, no, absolutely I, i'm thinking in terms of, of those four elements and i think gareth as you said to me isn't wood in in, in some in chinese philosophy the, the other element well in various traditions wood is considered a kind of fifth element yeah element, yes. and that you know that of course straddles a number of your current projects in all sorts of interesting ways. Well, I think, you know, just if, as we move sadly towards a close, of course, formally, and you can always find much more of Gideon's work online, as I mentioned. I mean, it's really important, I think, to, to acknowledge how significant this project already is before you've completed, uh, you know, the elemental cycle. I mean, it's, it's constantly asking itself questions about the nature and responsibility of the image to our times, about the best form of image making to communicate issues that in some ways are you know, intangible, can't, can't fully be held. Their traces and, and their, their uh, passing can be documented, but the, the full scale and implications of them are very, very hard um, to take on. Hence, perhaps, as you said earlier, you know, the terrible impasse we seem to find ourselves in on a global level in terms of proper infrastructure change around engaging with these issues. You're an individual, uh, any individual can only do so much, but you really are making incredible um, uh, impressions on all of us, I think, who see your images and really forcing us, whether we like it or not, to think about our own role and responsibility in the unfolding crisis and what we can do in some way to slow that down and to redirect it. So um, as we move to a formal close, I'd like to thank Joe and Michael um, enormously for staging this series of In Conversations, for asking me to be part of it. Um, thank you all uh, very much indeed for being with us. Um, do continue to track Gideon's work online in all the ways you know how, but please do now join me in whatever way you see fit, um, uh, raising a glass, bringing your hands together, muted or unmuted, um, to thank for his work and his time tonight, Gideon Mendel. Thank you very much indeed. So, so thank, thank, thank you so much, um, Gareth and um, Joan Michael. It's you know, been great to talk to you all. I, you know, I, I hope um, my work you know, has, some, has some kind of impact going forward you know on many, on many different levels that's that's all i can hope for um and stay tuned i'm going to be i think starting the process of a, a crowdfunding process towards my my book in the coming weeks and months thank you very much thank you thank you gideon and thank you gareth for for helping with that conversation enormously and, and opening up the the images that we saw and 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 what the some of the thinking behind it gideon on behalf of the rps I'd like to congratulate you on your honorary fellowship and thank you for, for bringing the immediacy of climate change to us and the humanity as well. And we're, we'll be really pleased to share details of the crowdfunding in, in due course. You know, it's an important topic and it's one I think we all need to be aware and try and do our bit towards. So on behalf of the RPS, thank you again, both of you, and thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. We will be making this talk available online as a recording afterwards, so do take the opportunity to catch up. Thank you and good night.